Welcome to Dig Deeper, a Leaky Foundation videocast. My name is Beth Green, and today we're talking with Dr. Dorothy Cheney. Well, so my name is Dorothy Cheney, and I'm a professor in the biology department at the University of Pennsylvania. And my area of study is primate behavior and primate cognition. So why is this type of research important? What can it tell us about ourselves and our evolution? Well, if you think about you know, human behavior and, and the human mind, we're a unique species. We don't, most of our recent um, relatives are extinct, the other hominids. And so we want to look toward, if we want to look at the origins of, of human behavior, we really want to look at our, the behavior and cognition of close relatives. And in that case, it's the non-human primates, such as the apes, like chimpanzees, or monkeys, uh, like baboons, um, who are less closely related to us, but are still of interest because they're very social. We're a very social species, and um, it looks as though we derive a large component of our sociality and the kind of brain that goes with being social from, from um, a common shared sociality with other primates. Who or perhaps what inspired you to get into this field of research? I was originally a history major and um, I took obviously in college I took some science courses and biology courses and to a large degree it was just simply memorization. You know, you're memorizing facts about the basic workings of a cell, for example, and it was really boring. And um, in my senior year in college, I took a course in the history of science, in part just to get rid of a science requirement, and it was on thoughts about evolution and genetics, and it was as if everything suddenly made sense, because suddenly there was a theory and a hypothesis behind, um, that kind of organized all the facts that I'd been forced to memorize, and so I became really interested in the evolution of behavior. Um, and in particular, the, uh, the way in which our own behavior and language may have evolved and the selective pressures that might have um, driven that kind of evolution. Tell me about a time you had a challenge or a setback in your research. Well, there are lots of challenges to the sorts of uh, research that I do. I do all of my research in, um, in Africa with wild animals. Um, and of course, when you first begin to study these animals, all they do is run away from you. Um, and it takes months and sometimes years to, to uh, habituate a group of, say, baboons or a group of chimpanzees so that they'll tolerate your presence. And this can be immensely frustrating and boring because you have all these interesting ideas you'd like to study, but you know these animals are running away from you. So it takes a long way, uh, time to kind of habituate. The other, of course, uh, is that uh, you have to raise money to do this sort of work, and that can be difficult. But on the whole, I think I've been really lucky. It's, it's been a huge amount of fun. And um, to the extent that there are challenges, there are challenges to everything. And, and um, it's, just, it's just a lot of fun to, to do what I do. So that, I'm really lucky. What is your favorite thing about being in the field? What I love about being in the field is, first of all, the independence that you are essentially on your own. You don't have anybody telling you what to do. You don't have to show up for anything. And it's also just really nice to, to watch animals and to see, to try to look at life from their perspective. And when you study animals in the wild, you're really looking at their behavior in the context in which it presumably evolved. So I study at the moment um, baboons who live in the, which live in the Okavango Delta of Botswana. And these animals are confronted with a variety of challenges in the form of predation primarily. They're eaten by lions and leopards and hyenas and crocodiles and you name it. And these animals um, have to cope with these sorts of challenges. They have to find food, they have to avoid being eaten. And in comparison to say work with captive animals where you're simply feeding them and you could have control over their lives, in this case you're really looking at their behavior with each other in the context in which they evolved and also having to, to sort of see how they, how they surmount these challenges. And that's just, a, again, a lot of fun, and it's, it's really rewarding to be able to do that. What do you think makes us human? That's an interesting question. There are many things that, that separate us from animals, in, in particular our um, language, our ability to speak, our ability to obsess about our mental states, to introspect, to you know, suspect people of deceiving us, to suspect people of you know, thinking what they know. But there are also a lot of similarities. And I think to the extent that we've discovered anything of importance or interest, what to me is most interesting is seeing how 
sociality and friendship really makes a huge difference to human health and we know that, that sociality and friendship makes a huge difference to human health and human longevity, particularly among women. And it's now becoming quite clear that this is true also of baboons and many other species of animals, even, even mice. And so what it appears to be, we, we now know from baboons, for example, that females who have close social bonds with other individuals, who are often their mothers or daughters, but not always. Um, sometimes females have very close bonds with non-relatives. Those females live longer, they have higher offspring survival, and it's quite independent of their dominance rank. So even a low-ranking female with close friends is going to do really well in terms of her reproductive success. And so what, what that seems to suggest is that the sort of motivation and obsession that, that we humans have to be, to establish friendships and to observe the friendships of others and observe the animosities of others, these are really ancient evolutionary traits that we share with lots of other animals. And, and that's been really fun to document. Of course, it takes a long time because you have to watch these animals for 20 or 30 years before you can determine who's achieving higher reproductive success. If you could find the definitive answer to any human origins question, which one would it be? I think I would love to know what the selective pressure is behind what people have called a theory of mind. We humans, certainly adult humans, after about the age of four children, indeed, after about the age of four, are able to recognize, for example, that their own thoughts and beliefs can be different from other individuals' thoughts and beliefs. So I can recognize when you might be ignorant of a fact, or I can recognize when I might be ignorant of a fact, and you could give me some information, provide me with some knowledge. Um, animals are really astute at recognizing other individuals' social relationships. They're really good at recognizing other individuals' visual perspectives, but they're terrible um, at recognizing other individuals' mental states. There, uh, there's no evidence that a chimpanzee, for example, recognizes when somebody else has a different belief than he does, or very little evidence. And yet they, they manage to survive quite well. Baboons really don't understand other individuals' mental processes in the way we do, and yet they can establish close friendships. So I would be fascinated by the selective pressures that uh, might have led to humans being unique among species in their ability to recognize the mental processes, and indeed to, to, to obsess about the mental processes of, of each other, because it really is uh, the basis of human culture and teaching and you know, elaborate tool use but we seem to be the only species that have achieved that, for better or for worse. I mean, otherwise, we, we also spend a huge amount of time worrying about, fretting about what other people think about us, and, and um, animals are fortunate never have to be bothered by these sorts of fears. 